today I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I do and then try to draw that into some connections or nascent observations about rethinking the relationship between religion or religions or believers, I think we will agree on the believers level, and the notion of human rights. Um, my work is focused on questions of religious pluralism, so I like to say questions that arise when lots of different believers assert claims to the same space, um, same theological space. It's only for us. We're the only ones that are saved. We're the best. We're the final. We're the true. All of these sorts of claims. How do we make sense of that? Of course, it's really easy to just not make sense of it and to say, and this might be an area that um, Dr. Na Naeem and I can have a discussion later. Of course, it's very easy not to make sense of it and just to carry on as usual and say, we are the best, but you're okay. You know, I can treat you nicely, but we're really still the best. I'm interested in probing that and seeing um, what kind of obstacles and resources lie within traditions for perhaps charting new trajectories. Um, specifically, my work focuses on the Quran and looking for those resources and obstacles within the Quranic text. Um, briefly, the central question of my work is really simple. It is a question of what the Quran as, and perhaps some of you know, but others may not, so I should step back for a second. The Quran within the Islamic tradition is not just a scripture or book, it is the word of God. And if you're familiar with other words of God, perhaps Jesus Christ, you can understand better the place and role that the Quranic text plays within the Islamic community. It's not just a book, it is the word of God. That doesn't mean it has one interpretation or that we have access to the meaning, but it does mean it's really important. It's really important to engage and to struggle with and grapple with. And so my research focuses on this one really simple question, and that is, what does the Quran say about the religious other? Now, as was mentioned previously, um, it's very easy to say, oh, well, the Quran says, and the Quran actually says lots of great things about the religious other, things like, oh, they received divine guidance, and oh, Jesus and Moses and Noah, all of these people, of course they were true prophets. It says, oh, the Gospels and the Torah, true scriptures. All ones are wonderful things like this. But then it says some other things. It says things such as, you know, there are believers and there are unbelievers. And pretty much being a believer is a good thing to be in terms of rewards and punishments. And not being a believer, not so, I was going to say not so hot, but in fact, might be hot. Um, so there's this very ambivalent discourse that's going on. So it's very, very easy when it comes to discussions of human rights or religious rights, which is my um, interest, to just privilege the beautiful, to privilege the positive. And there's lots to privilege. But it's not an honest investigation. And also, it's a very weak and susceptible investigation. And so I want to look at the nuances of both the obstacles and the resources. So enough about what I do. I actually have a book coming out in March, since we're talking about books, <laughs> that if you're really interested in this topic, you can read. It's called Never a Holy Other, so you could read the nuances of that. But I think what's more relevant for today is to discuss why this even interests me. I mean, perhaps I'm just an anomaly and I find it fascinating. But there's actually a very clear reason. Um, it's not just an exegetical or intellectual interest or textual examination. It arises really from the observation of how um, interreligious engagement and interaction takes place in the world around us. Um, I don't think we need to look far for examples of interreligious intolerance or violence or oppression. It can be subtle, it can be extreme and very obvious. And Muslims have been both the perpetrators of such actions as well as the recipients of such actions. Um, you know, ongoing waves of violence and oppression of this sort, I feel, compel us to ask about the role of our various theological resources in perpetuating or encouraging such interreligious interaction or less than positive interreligious interaction. What does the fact that the Quran might have some less than favorable things to say about certain religious communities, how does that connect with interreligious engagement on the ground? Does it connect? 
look, it's very easy and simplistic to say there's an automatic and necessary connection. Well, there's not. But it's certainly negative depictions of religious others can certainly be thrown on the fire as excess fuel once the fire is going. So it can run the gamut of starting the issues, contributing to the issues, preventing resolution of these kind of interactions. But my interest in this question of how the Quran depicts a religious other or how religious traditions and religious believers depict other religious believers. And as was noted, this is not just an inter-religious issue, it's intra-religious as well. My interest in this is not just stemmed from that, from violence and oppression, the obvious things. It also stems from something that I've noticed a lot in the context of the United States, especially in the last decade. And this is the surge and rise of inter-religious interaction. Now, this is when we say, oh, yay, people getting along, doing great things. This is what we want. Well, yeah, sure, it's what we, I mean, I think it's what we want, right? It's what I want. Um, people working together, doing all sorts of um, projects that run the gamut from just inter-religious dialogue where we learn about each other, but also to a lot of social justice projects and community projects, whether they be relief or um, medical related, health related, education related. So we look on this and this is a wonderful trend and it doesn't seem to be a trend that's going to abate. It seems to be the new norm and especially among American Muslims, um, which is the context I'm speaking from, so I will privilege it momentarily, um, especially among American Muslims, it seems to be something that's become much more acceptable. It's seen as something good to do. So you say, why would this provoke her to want to call the resources? Well, I'll tell you exactly why. Because among the majority of these Muslims who are engaged in that action, these type of positive, beautiful actions, you will still find exclusive theological claims. You will still find that many of these individuals still retain an unproblematized belief in the finality, um, superiority, or truth of Islam over other religions. Okay, I'll wrap it up. There's a sort of bifurcation that exists. The practical experiences have not had any impact on the theological claims. Now I know this will be a point of contention for us. This seems like it might be a good way to operate. However, my view is that it's not a good way to operate. In fact, it's unstable and it cannot be sustained. It is actually, in fact, a luxury of situations in which we find ourselves in calm and bounty. But the second that crisis arises, this kind of bifurcation between, I'll treat you nice, but I really think I'm better, falls apart. We shore up our religious identities. When we are threatened, we stick to the th people we think are like us. And as was mentioned, religious identity is usually at the top of that pecking order for people who have it. Boundaries go up. Not a bad thing in and of itself. But boundaries go up and we start to say, oh, we are better because of these claims. And if there has been no seeping, no problematization across the practical theological boundary, theology will become the weapon of exclusion, oppression, and violations of human rights. Okay? So let me just make, I have one minute maybe, so let me just make my, some brief observations about this. The first is that no one can deny that religion, religions, or believers, and human rights conflict. They certainly do, okay? We have enough history to know that. The second is that the response to this observation about conflict cannot and should not be this attempt at bifurcation. We have to find a way to have a dialogical relationship between religion or theology and human rights. My view, well, let me just step back for a second. Part of finding a way for that dialogical relationship is that we have to challenge the notion of both human rights and religion as orthodoxies. Look, we're used to talking about religion as an orthodoxy, but as was mentioned, human rights is as much of an orthodoxy. There is the one way, it's monovalent, monolithic, we apply it to everyone. We see a problem with this with religion. It's equally problematic on both sides. It doesn't account for experience. It doesn't account for multiplicity. It doesn't account for contextualization. So we need to go beyond that. Just make one more point about this. My vision for one way to go beyond this is to think about this dialogical relationship as a relationship 
of mutual destabilization. Okay, we don't normally like destabilization. I'm not talking about destruction. I'm talking about destabilization. Human rights discourse should raise issues and questions and challenges that make theologians go, hmm, really? Not, oh yeah, we already have that solved, but hmm. Okay, I come from the Islamic tradition. You wanna know what? I sat on a panel last week where someone was asked about homosexuality and the stock off the shelf answer about was given. Islam, homosexuality, nope. And you know what I thought? We don't even think about the question. We don't even think about it. This idea of mutual destabilization is about acknowledging that human rights discourse can raise challenges to religion and theology and that religion and theology can do the same. And so I'll stop there because I'm gonna get my wrap up sign I'm good at here. But I would think that this is one place that we can begin and hopefully this new project will begin to chart waters. Okay, thank you. <laughs>